In the previous episodes, we've talked a lot about the ways in which plants are important to us as humans. How plants are used in different cultures around the world, how their components are useful to us as foods, as medicines, as fibers, etc. But we haven't really talked about why plants might have those useful components. What benefit do these components give plants, if any, and what does it mean to them if we employ them? These are the questions that I'd like to get at in this episode, um, and I'm going to try to do so by going through a number of examples. Let's start with something like mangoes. For instance, we've talked a lot about mangoes in other episodes. We've talked about the ways in which mangoes have been transported across the earth by humans, and how they've been adopted and adapted into different cultures. And including places like Hawaii, then where they become just part of daily life here. We've also talked about uh, their uses. Of course, there's many different varieties of mangoes, and apart from food, mangoes are also used as medicines, as ritual, and are important in some different religions as well. But as you're sitting eating and enjoying a mango, have you ever stopped to wonder why do mango trees produce mango fruits that are so ono or so delicious to us? Well, there's different answers to the question. Different cultures may have origin stories about m mangoes and um, what to attribute them to. For instance, a gift from the god or gods. But we can also look at this question from an evolutionary perspective and ask, why did mango trees evolve to have such delicious fruit? And the answer is, of course, so that they could attract animals to disperse their seeds. Plants need to disperse their seeds to ensure that they have higher chances of survival and so that they can spread, of course, as well. Um, and so they have involved a myriad of ways to effectively disperse. As it turns out, many of the sweet, fleshy uh, fruits that attract us and that we love so much evolve specifically because they are sweet and attractive to other animals who are also uh, evolving with them and who could disperse them. Many of these dispersers are large of, of the fruits that we love, are birds and other mammals. As it turns out, the original dispersers of mangoes are fruit bats. These bats are actually very interesting, and this is just an aside, because they live in large colonies. There's one male with up to, uh, I think, eight or so female bats. They're nocturnal, and they hang uh, from their feet during the day. They can't, the funny thing about these bats is that they can't land apparently very gracefully at all, but they sort of crash into the bushes or the branches in order to come to a stop. In any case, these bats are dispersers. They can suck on the fruit and swallow it and disperse the seeds of the mangoes. Now, of course, in the many places where mangoes have been transported, there's not always these fruit bats. Um, but in any case, humans have now become the major dispersers of mangoes, taking them across the world and further, of course, than the bats could. So, by eating a mango, what we're really doing is taking advantage of what nature evolved uh, for bats as an incentive to help mango tree disperse its seeds. Why are some plant seeds high in oils? We really depend on plant oils um, for much of our cuisine today. Think of all of you who eat fast food and the amount of plant oils that go in there, making french fries and chips. And not even just fast food, but across the world, um, Traditional cuisines have incorporated and adapt a lot of high and deep fried foods into their into their into their cuisines and diets. Plants that produce high seeds high in oil like olives or sunflowers, canola, etc., kukui, which is also uh, produces important oil. Why do plants have seeds that that are high in oil? Well. Again, it has to do with the survival of the seed. When seeds are dispersed and they're going to begin to germinate, they need a source of energy because, of course, they don't have leaves yet that they can use to photosynthesize and get energy from the sun. Um, so what they use, in part, for energy is the oil. 
So when you're eating a french fry or you're eating a chip, what you're really eating is the energy that was meant for a little seedling. Why do carrot plants have carrots? Why do sweet potatoes have sweet potatoes? I'm sure that many of you can guess that these are storage organs for the plant uh, that help them store it well, that store their energy. In the case of carrots, they're biennial. That means they, take, uh, they live for two years. In the first year, uh, they, they grow. They have leaves, of course, which photosynthesize. And the energy that they, they make, they all store in the root. Um, then in the second year, they use all that energy that was stored in order to reproduce, to produce flowers and seeds and go on to, to, to propagate in the future. So when we're eating a carrot, what we're really doing is eating all that stored energy that was then going to go in to produce more carrots. In Uala or sweet potato, it's the same thing. In this case, it's a storage root that we're eating. In yams, it's uh, a storage tuber, etc. They're all examples of we're taking, the, the plant is storing its energy in order to be able to use it for, for uh, propagation. What we're doing is we're sort of hijacking that, finding these little catches of, of uh, stored energy and we're using that for ourselves. Leaves, the similar thing. Leaves, of course, the green leaves that we like to eat, like different kinds of um, lettuce and spinach and kale, etc. These are all photosynthesizing for the plant and bringing in the energy that plant needs to reproduce. Stems could be photosynthetic in some cases, certainly, but of course provide the structure that the plant needs as well. So the things that, that we then uh, take advantage of plants of in terms of food are either there for other animals, which can then help the plants propagate, or of course for the plants themselves more directly, like the leaves or the roots or the stems, etc. All for the benefit of the plant that we are simply taking advantage of. What about plants used for spices and flavoring? What about essential oils? Why do plants smell so good? If I crush a Thai basil leaf in my hand, aroma fills the air, and this is something really enjoyable um, to most of us. But that odor and that taste that we find so appealing that we use in our cooking is actually poison to many insects. The oils chemically mimic insect juvenile hormones, which, insect, which regulate insect development. So actually, insects eating this will have their development severely interrupted and will fail to develop into adults. So what we find so pleasurable in an essential oil um, that makes things taste so good to us is actually kind of macabre. It's a, sort of, it's a, it's a pretty gruesome poison to other, or, or other organisms. Some plants in the mint family grow in really dry environments. The essential oils that they hold in their leaves um, under this heat, they vaporize and then they're absorbed by soil particles where they're thought to act as allelochemicals that are chemicals in the soil that prevent the growth of other species. Um, also act as um, antibacteria, antifungal, uh, um, etc. So again, these things that we find so pleasurable all have functions some of them have functions in the plant that help the plant survive through by helping it defend it. How about um, another example? Why are chilies so hot? We've talked about chilies before. We talked about, again, uh, their evolution in Mexico and the way they've been transported across the world, again, by humans and adopted, and ad adapted into cultures across the world. And they're now a fundamental part of the cuisine of many, many places. But as you're sitting and eating a really spicy meal, have you ever thought to think, why are chilies so hot? The answer is that wild chilies grow out in deserts, and apparently to germinate, the little seedlings can't grow out in the desert sun because it's, it's too harsh an environment, but they need the shade of, of some shrubs. Um, the question is, how can they get from the chili plant which grows out to, how can they get to the shade of those, of those shrubs? Well, it looks like all mammals, aside from humans, either have an aversion to chili lace food, they don't like them, or are actually killed by high doses. Birds, however, not only tolerate chili, but what they do is they pass it through their gut and the seeds still come out intact and are able to germinate. Now, birds feed on the berries of shrubs that chilies need to germinate under. Um, so by doing that, of course, they, they pass out the seeds, and which can fall beneath the shrubs and germinate under these nice conditions. 
So the capsicums are related um, to defense against other mammals that would eat the seeds and destroy them. Sorry, by mammals that would eat the seeds and destroy them. But um, they're there for the birds, which are the only ones who will actually help disperse them to the right places. Now, the spices and chilies are both examples, of course, of foods that are also used as medicines. Why do plants have components that act as medicines for humans? We spend a lot of time talking about the different, uh, talking about medical traditions and different cultures and the diversity of medicinal plants used and some other functions. Now, we do know as well, of course, that for many medicinal plants, we don't know how they work biochemically in the body. We can't identify any compounds that seem to have an effect, or we know that there's multiple compounds acting all together. But for some plants, we have identified what these things are, and for some of these, they do seem to have ecological functions, though of course not all of them do. And if some of them, would, and even those that do, we probably don't know. Many, for many of them, we don't know what their functions are. Some of the chemical compounds in medicinal plants that seem to uh, be bioactive do act as, or can act as defenses against herbivory. So alkaloids, for instance, can inhibit um, DNA or RNA. Cyanogenic glycosoids um, can inhibit cellular respiration. I should also mention that alkaloids can actually be induced by herbivory. These kinds of compounds can all act as defenses against um, herbivory. Another example is St. John's root, which you heard about in another episode. At least some of the active compounds in St. John's root um, are thought to be hypersins. Uh, these may contribute to antidepressant action um, and they do contribute to the well-documented antimicrobial and antiviral activities. Now, in a study that was done a few years ago looking at uh, hypersin, hypersin concentrations in the leaves of St. John's Wort, I found that the leaf material that had the highest concentrations was some overgrazed pasture. And at the time of collection, um, the site was inundated with grasshoppers that were feeding on the floor. So again, this may also play a role in defense. Again, I don't want to suggest that everything plays a role in, in, in defense. I do want to suggest that and certainly in some species, this does seem to be the case. What about if we move from medicinal plants onto psychoactive plants? Have you ever sat down at, while you're drinking a coffee and wondered why on earth do coffee plants have caffeine? Uh, now we know, of course, because we've talked about coffee before, that coffee originated in the highlands of Ethiopia. And we know the origin story that apparently, at least as the story goes, it was, dis it was discovered by a herder who noticed that his goats were, when feeding on the coffee, became all frisky. Now, of course, caffeine is precisely what makes coffee so, so interesting and so important to us. Um, caffeine stimulates our nervous systems. It reaches the bloodstream five minutes after the liquid is swallowed. It stimulates our hearts, it causes rises in metabolic rates, it keeps us alert, it mimics feelings produced when our body produces adrenaline, etc, etc. Why on earth do coffee plants produce caffeine? Well, it's thought that caffeine is produced by coffee as a defense against, against um, herbivory, that is against grazing. Now caffeine occurs throughout the coffee plant, um, but as the plant grows from seed to seedling, the caffeine actually doubles. So, uh, as the seedling, of course, is quite vulnerable, the caffeine concentration increases. During leaf development, the concentration is highest, specifically when the young, soft leaves are most vulnerable to grazing. Uh, then when the fruits are ripe, the caffeine, co the caffeine concentration decreases, and of course the fruits are, are, are wanting to be eaten, the fruits are there to be eaten by um, dispersers who could then not eat the seeds, but disperse the seeds. Uh, researchers have also done feeding experiments with insects and shown that caffeine can kill many different kinds of things such as larvae of tobacco hornworm, they can cause sterility in beetles, etc, etc. So again, it seems like coffee or caffeine is, was is an important component um, of, of defense for the coffee plant. Why does Pakololo have THC? THC is, of course, the psychoactive principle in marijuana or pakololo. For those of you who do smoke marijuana, when you're sitting there smoking, have you ever thought about why on earth does the plant produce something that makes you feel like this? 
Well, it looks like now we have a lot of evidence that, as in the case of caffeine, THC is a toxin to certain insects, and it's used in the plant as a defense against insects that try to feed on it. People have done all kinds of studies um, showing this, but one of the interesting sort of weird things uh, that they have found is that some insects are able to withstand uh, THC, so they're able to tolerate it, but those insects showed a preference for feeding on strains that were more and more and more potent in terms of P THC until they were actually lethal for the insects. So again, an ecological role for something that we use as a psychoactive plant. Similarly, why do some plants cause humans to hallucinate? You've heard about hallucinogenic plants, we've talked about them. They're used by humans to seek different kinds of complex knowledge, to enhance ways to communicate with the ancestors, to communicate with the animal world, to enhance sensations of all kinds, and, and for, for enjoyment. Why would some plants have chemicals in them that cause us to hallucinate? Well. Many hallucinogens can contain chemicals that resemble mammalian neurotransmitters, like serotonin. Um, these regulate sensory perception and can cause all kinds of effects. Now, some plants, and in some cases, produce hallucinogens as defensive comments to compounds to protect them from being eaten by small mammals. We think of something like uh, the morning glory, Rivea crumbosa which 13 seeds of it can cause crazy hallucinations in, uh, hallucinations in people. But think of what would happen to something like a rat, which is so much smaller, eating just one seed. It would, of course, probably kill it. The point is that humans are unable to in, ingest these things because we're much bigger uh, and because we have the cultural memory to control dosage. You've got to remember that from an evolutionary perspective, humans are pretty new in many environments. That is, environments, plants and animals evolved for millions of years before humans even got there. And so in many cases, we have, very, we have had very little effect on the evolution of these secondary compounds in plants that have evolved um, in response to the pressures that were in the environment, including grazers or herbivores, etc., as ways for the plants to defend themselves against the other organisms, the other creatures that are there. So it's interesting because despite our lack of participation in this evolutionary process of these secondary com uh, chemicals, um, because our fundamental biochemistry is similar to those other creatures with which these plants evolved, um, we could take advantage of them. So what's lethal for them in a small doses may just cause other lesser effects on us um, in, because we're so much bigger. So the multitude of uses, including the delight that many human cultures derive from hallucinogenic plants, is a result of our common heritage of neurotransmission with the plant's real enemy. So when we start to think about things from an evolutionary perspective and we start to understand some of them, at least, as defenses um, against animals and other things, um, we can start to see how there is and why there is a continuum for humans between things like spices, medicines, psychoactive plants, and poisons in terms of dosage. That is, many of our spices in higher dosage are medicines. Medicines in higher dosage could be psychoactive plants which of course in higher doses are poison and can kill us. Similarly, why does Ava have cavatones? And I put this in here to demonstrate a point. We don't know why Ava has cavatones. Cavatones are thought to be the biochemically active compounds in Ava. Um, and this is one example of many where we don't know the ecological significance of this, these compounds. And um, we don't know if they that could be because we, we haven't done studies, but it also could be because we, there, there doesn't have to be an ecological significance either. So we can't see that there's always cause and effect, again, or that it's one chemical causing one thing. These systems, again, I want to emphasize, are pretty complex. So we've talked about food plants, spices, medicines, psycho psychoactive plants, etc. But what about plants that we just love as ornamentals? Why do some orchids, for instance, here, we produce a lot of orchids here in Hawaii, why do some orchids smell so good? 
Well, of course, it's to help attract pollinators who also like the smell uh, to come and pollinate the flowers so that that plant can reproduce. Now, interestingly, many orchids are pollinated by bees of the Euglossinae. These are metallic bees, and um, it's interesting because the male visits flowers even though the, the orchids have no nectar there. Now, another thing is that some orchids, I should say, insects will come and visit plants to get the nectar. That's what they want. But while they're getting the nectar, they'll actually pollinate the flower, um, which is what the flower wants. Some orchids, and this is an aside, but some orchids actually um, have really neat colors and designs that we find really attractive, and we use them as ornamentals, but they're there to mimic nectaries, um, or even to, to, to mimic females. So when males, for instance, come to the, the flower, they can attempt to copulate, and actually end up pollinating the flower. So they're the flower, these things that we enjoy as, as plants that are really neat looking are actually the flowers being very deceptive and very tricky um, to, to try lure insects in to pollinate them. In case of these euglossane bees, um, what they do is the males visit the flowers even though there's no nectar there. And what they do is they go to collect the fragrances. And they store these fragrances in these special pockets in their hind legs and they use them for their own sexual purposes. That is, once they have just the right combination of fragrances, they suddenly become really attractive to other males, and therefore the males start to form groups. And it's only when the males form groups that they become attractive to the females. And of course, then mating can ensue. So some of the orchids that we cultivate here, because we love their aromas, um, are actually just there as bee aphrodisiacs. In terms of other ornamental plants, a lot of the things we like are things that look unusual, spotted things, things that have grading colors, etc. Um, so like some of the colia, some of the aroids. Now, of course, we've bred things to look like this as well, but those that occur naturally um, are thought to have some ecological significance. They're thought to mimic patterns of nutrient deficiency to make them less attractive to herbivores. So for instance, yellowing can, can, can mimic chlorosis. Um, purple tints mimic, mimic, uh, sorry, mimic depletion of potassium or phosphorus. And finally, other useful properties, of course, of plants like fibers that are useful to humans um, also play roles in structure of the plant, hold helping the plant keep the plant upright, and resisting herbivores. For instance, herbivores, of course, really like leaves that are high in nutrients, that are soft, and they're easily digestible. If your leaf is full of fibers, that's something that the you know, herbivore is not going to get much nutrition from and also not going to be able to digest well. And of course, important fibers can really help in dispersal. So cotton, we know, has been so important to human cultures across the world, continues to be. And cotton is simply a way that the plant has devised to help disperse its seeds by wind. Now the lesson of all this is that you can look at things in different ways. You can, you can look at useful plants from the perspective of humans and why they're useful and how they're useful to us. Um, you can look cross-culturally and try to understand the different explanations that people have come up for where plants came from. And you can also look at it from the plant's perspective or from an evolutionary perspective and try to think why a plant may have something like this that is useful to us. Another thing to keep in mind is that not only have humans learned um, to take advantage of these different things that plants produce for their own benefit, um, not, ha not only are we very opportunistic, but we have also learned to, to change and to manipulate plants for our own benefit. Of course, we know that we've done that, and we've talked about this before in terms of selection um, for different characteristics in plants. But we've also learned, for instance, to decrease toxicity um, now you know a lot of these chemicals are toxic and in plants are toxic and are there as defenses. We've learned to decrease toxicity of food plants, for instance, by using a number of, of processes. So things like heating to decrease it, things like putting them in solution so that they'll leach out, fermentation, drying them out, uh, different kinds of uh, physical processing, and geophagy, which is eating clay. 
we've not only learned these these physical ways of, of getting rid of the toxins, but we have also learned to change plant chemistry through domestication. Now we knew we, we we've talked about the ways in which we've changed plant morphology and other kinds of of uh, characteristics of the plant through through domestication, but we've also changed plant chemistry, and this has really big implications if we think that some of the secondary compounds in plants are useful as defenses. If we, if we change plant chemistry, we need to think about what impacts does that have for the plants themselves. So just as some examples, in watermelon, which of course we love because it's so sweet and tasty, uh, through selection, through the, we have decreased cucurbitacins to decrease bitterness. Yams, we've changed saponin co and alkaloid context to decrease toxins. In eggplants, we've changed glycalkaloids and saponins to decrease toxins. In coffee, of course, in THC, we've done the very opposite. We've increased caffeine and we've increased THC. But in the cases in which we've decreased, in our food plants, in the cases in which we've decreased these toxins, these chemicals, um, what are the implications? Well, the implications is that if these um, elements are there, as defenses against, if these toxins are there as de defenses against herbivory, when we take them away, of course we make those plants much more vulnerable to herbivory. And there's two consequences of this. One is, of course, then they're vulnerable and they can be eaten, but if we are growing them, we're not going to let that happen. What it means is that the plants can no longer defend themselves, so what we have to do is put on poisons ourselves, and that's what we call pesticides. So the more we reduce the natural defenses in plants, the more poisons we need to put on them in order th for them to be able to survive. The second consequence of that is that um, not only does this have, have consequences for um, agriculture in terms of the pesticides that are, are needed to grow these crops, but another implication is that this may also have implications for human health. So we're decreasing these toxins um, as we're selecting these plants, but these toxins may play roles in helping to maintain human, human health. So for instance, the saponins and yams that we've really decreased, well, those um, saponins can also play an important role in maintaining human health by, anti by acting as antioxidants. We know that saponins can play an important role as antioxidants. So by decreasing the saponins in the yams, and then us eating the yams, um, these may be less nutritious, less beneficial to us in helping us maintain our health than those with higher levels of saponins in them. Interestingly, just a couple of days ago in the Honolulu Advertiser, there was an article that just reviewed a little bit of the benefits of organic foods. And one of the things they mentioned was the studies that have come out comparing things like antioxidants in organic versus non-organic food. And they have found that in various cases, antioxidants are higher in organic foods because those organic foods have to grow against in environments with their natural pests and therefore they produce them whereas in um, non-organic agriculture they're dosed with with chemicals with pesticides so they don't need to produce these things so again the point is by changing plant chemistry this has implications for agriculture for the environment and also potentially for human health So the key concepts in this talk are that the chemical and structural components, and structural I'm talking about things like fibers, that humans find so useful in plants can have important ecological functions. Now again, I want you to keep in mind that nature can be playful, that not everything has to have an ecological function, that nature is complex, that there's interaction amongst chemicals, and that we can't always look for cause and effect relationships. However, it is important and interesting to look at things from a biological and evolutionary perspective and, and try to figure out which ones do have ecological significance. Uh, two, many plants that have toxic chemicals, um, humans have learned to detoxify them in a number of ways. However, plant chemicals can be both ben beneficial to human health and plant health, and this is implications for both agriculture and human diet.